What up? What up? It's Friday. A lot of people checked out. We checking in on this live real quick. Let's have a quick live. It's a lot of breaking news going on. I wanted to have a conversation about it. So shout out to everybody checking in with me on this Friday. Trying to get my man. I mean, if you haven't heard, I mean, it's breaking news in the hip hop community. Um, the murderer or one of the people involved in Tupac Shakur's murder has been arrested. And um, this is breaking news because I never thought I'd see this day. Like, like they, they just don't arrest people when it come to our hip hop icons being murdered. Uh, for whatever reason, them cases always go unsolved. So this is something I definitely wanted to talk about. So <clears throat> I wanted to get my man DJ Vlad in on this conversation. Vlad, what up? Matter of fact, yo, I see my man Reg Hunt in the building. Reg, what up? Shout to everybody checking in with me. Vlad, where you at? Vlad, where you at? Let's get this live popping on this Friday. Instagram be so buggy. I don't understand it. Like this is this is crazy. Shout to my girl, I ride for myself. I see you, Diva. Shout to the BX. BX in the building. Vlad, I see you just jumped in. I got your request. Right in your alley. And so immediately when I heard the news, I was like, yo, we got to do this. Shout to my, my boy, Jerz, just jumping in the building. DJ. Hey, Vlad, what up? What up, man? I'm chilling. I'm chill. Yo, you know, Vlad, first and foremost, everybody knows that voice. Not everybody know the face. So <laughs> shout to you for jumping in on this live real quick. Of course, man. My pleasure. Yo, I'm going to shout out to my man, Jamil Spencer. I see you just in the building. Vlad, it's breaking news. The, the, in our community, so often um, our hip-hop icons, they're killed, they're murdered, and for whatever reason, it goes unsolved. Mm -hmm. Today, during the 50th year of hip-hop, it's breaking news. And, it, and it's right in your background because in some ways, you can kind of take credit for breaking this case. How do you feel about uh, Keefe D being arrested in the murder of Tupac Shakur? Well, I don't think I can take credit in, in breaking this case. Um, I mean, Greg Kading got a, a proffer agreement from Keefe years ago where Keefe admitted to his involvement in, in Pac's murder. Um, and then Keefe wrote a book. So he essentially Actually broke his own case with that book and my interview was the first kind of like serious sit down interview with Keefe after that book was already released we had gotten a copy of it um, and, and the interview really follows the blueprint of that book so um, you know we, we played a role in it um, you know I, I wouldn't say that I broke the case though you know what I'm saying uh, you know we have, we have an involvement in it and you know I think it'll go down as history as you know what it is you know, Vlad, and, and, and I want to choose my words better. I, I, I think that it was your platform um, that really shined a, a, a big light. Because if, if I'm not mistaken, has anybody done more interviews surrounding the life and death of, of Tupac Shakur than Vlad TV? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so either. I don't think so. But I think that's a testament to... Um owning your own platform and making your own decisions. You know, there's no way that like BT would have, you know, co-signed so many Pac interviews or, you know, stuff like that. They'd be like, all right, cool, you covered it. Let's go to something else, you know, but, but the ability to, to, to green light my own projects, I think, uh, you know, is a benefit to someone who's passionate about something. You, you, you know something, what is it about that case? Because you really have stuck with it, and you've covered it from every angle imaginable. What what is it about that case that really attracted you to it that you would not let up on it? I, I think I found out about 
the, the story behind that case in 2007, I think. So you think it's been, what, 16 years? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Uh, since I've known the story behind what happened, like as a, uh, you know, it, it's still, I mean, even to this day, it's still an unsolved case, right? So you're a fan. I mean, I was a big Tupac fan when I was, before even thinking about getting into the music industry, All Eyes on Me was one of my favorite albums. I listened to it religiously. Uh, Back of Belly, I thought it was a brilliant album. And then, you know, his other stuff as well, I'd always check for. So you have this, this, uh, high profile murder in broad, you know, in, in public, uh, in Las Vegas with arguably the biggest rapper of all time to this day. Uh, and it's completely unsolved. And then, and then in 2007, someone I knew from LA that I was just hanging out with, they kind of like told me what happened. They're like, Oh yeah, you know, that person knew Orlando and he was a crip and this is what happened. And this is the story. This is the story. And I'm like, shit, like no one's been talking about this. Like really? And, and, and in LA, it was like common knowledge. Like everybody knew about it. This, this was not some high ranking dude that was like somehow in some inner circle. Nah, this was just a, a regular neighborhood dude that, that knew the story. So um, it just got me very intrigued in it. And so I started to kind of dig into it. And then when, when the Keefe confession tapes uh, came out, the proper agreement, it was like, okay, now we actually have a person in the car who's who knew Keefe personally and with that you know we did our first sit down interview uh, with him you know that was his first and I think he had done something on BET before but this was like the first sit down multi hour life story interview about not just the event but what led up to the actual uh, shooting uh, and then what happened afterwards and then all the affiliation by right? how he knows Big and he knows Puff and he was in this music video and he was you know and Orlando was doing this and you know this is we were at these shows and, and whatever else to kind of just show how all the pieces fit together. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was basically like, like the whole thing and how it, you know, how it came together. Yeah. Let me ask you something. You, you keep using the term a proffer agreement. What, what exactly is that? A proffer agreement, um, AKA queen for a day. What that means is, okay. So I mean, I, I, I'll just say instead of, you know, bringing up just like, uh, you know, a make-believe situation. What happened particularly with Keefe was he was caught in what I believe was a large uh, PCP uh, distribution situation where he was facing life in prison. PCP is a very, you know, high-end, you know, serious drug. So with the amount of PCP they caught him with, with his priors and everything else like that, he would have been definitely facing life in prison yeah, if convicted. So what they did, you know, the guy that was investigating it, uh, Greg Kading essentially offered him a deal. And this is what a proffer agreement is. It meant that, okay, listen, we're going to ask you a bunch of questions about this case. That's not the case that you're dealing with right now. Here's a totally other case, which we're investigating, which we feel that you're somehow involved in, which is the Tupac murder. So we're going to ask you all this stuff about the Tupac murder and whatever you say can't then be used against you to convict you for your involvement in it. And if, if what you're saying proves to be true, you know, that if you're lying, lying about, about a bunch of shit and we, we, we find out, you know, we could prove that you're lying, then the whole deal is off the table. But if we could prove that, you know, if we feel based on our own investigation that all this is true, then none of it could be used against you and you walk away from life in prison. Mm -hmm. AKA, so. Queen for a day, meaning that that particular day you could say whatever you could admit, you could say I killed all these people, I sold all these drugs, I kidnapped all these people, blah 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 blah. Whatever it is that you say could then not be used against you in a court of law. Um, and as long as now, if you're caught lying, then like I said, it could all be thrown out. But all that was basically the deal. He did the deal. He told them everything they asked for. Um, and then based on what they found, they're like, okay, cool. Check you, uh, you did what you're supposed to do. We're dropping all these charges. You're able to walk free. Um, the weird part about this is that, um, you know, Greg, Greg was secretly recording this, you know, I don't think he was aware that there was a recording happening and then publicly released, uh, some of this audio footage. 
And that was sort of the basis of like a documentary that he did as well as, you know, I had some of that audio as well when I did the Keefe interview because I interviewed Greg, Greg before. So, so when Greg uh, recorded it, did he record it on, on behalf of himself or behalf of, of the police department? The police department. I forgot what exact. I don't. I don't remember if he was FBI. No, I don't. I don't remember what particular uh, police organization he was working for. But he was doing an investigation at the time. But once he quit, he just took took all that stuff it's, with him. Got you. Yeah. Got you. I don't. It's still. I mean, even to this day, it's still an unsolved case, right? So, you're a fan. I mean, I was a big Tupac fan when I was before even thinking about getting into the music industry. All eyes on me was one of my favorite albums. I listened to it religiously. Uh, Back of Belly, I thought it was a brilliant album. And then, you know, his other stuff as well, I'd always check for. So you have this this uh, high-profile murder in broad, you know, in, in public uh, in Las Vegas with arguably the biggest rapper of all time to this day. Uh, and it's completely unsolved. And then, and then in 2007, someone I knew from LA that I was just hanging out with, they kind of like told me what happened. They're like, oh yeah, you know, that person knew Orlando and he was a crip and this is what happened. And this is the story, this is the story. And I'm like, shit, like no one's been talking about this. Like really? And, and, and in LA, it was like common knowledge. Like everybody knew about it. This, this was not some high ranking dude that was like somehow in some inner circle. No, nah, this was just a, a regular neighborhood dude that, that knew the story. So um, it just got me very intrigued in it. And so I started to kind of dig into it. And then when, when the Keefe confession tapes uh, came out, the proper agreement, it was like, okay, now we actually have a person in the car who's somebody who knew Keefe personally. And with that, you know, we did our first sit down interview. Uh, with him, you know, that was his first and I think he had done something on BET before but this was like the first sit down multi hour life story interview about not just the event, but what led up to the actual uh, shooting. Uh, and then what happened afterwards and then all the affiliation by how he knows big and he knows puff and he was in this music video and he was, you know, and Orlando was doing this and you know, this is we were at these shows and, and whatever else to kind of just show how all the pieces fit together. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I was basically like like the whole thing and how it, you know, how it came together. Yeah, let me ask you something. You you keep using the term a proffer agreement. What what exactly is that? A proffer agreement, um, aka queen for a day. What that means is, okay. So I mean, I, I, I'll just say instead of you know bringing up just like a you know a make believe situation. What happened particularly with Kifi? was he was caught in what I believe was a large uh, PCP uh, distribution situation where he was facing life in prison. PCP is a very, you know, high end, you know, serious drug. So with the amount of PCP they caught him with, with his priors and everything else of like that, he would have been definitely facing life in prison yeah, if convicted. So what they did, you know, the guy that was investigating, uh, Greg Kading, essentially offered him a deal. And this is what a proffer agreement is. It meant that, okay, listen, we're going to ask you a bunch of questions about this case that's not the case that you're dealing with right now. Here's a totally other case, which we're investigating, which we feel that you're somehow involved in, which is the Tupac murder. So we're going to ask you all this stuff about the Tupac murder. And whatever you say can't then be used against you to convict you for your involvement in it. And if if what you're saying proves to be true, you know, that if you're lying, lying about, about a bunch of shit and we, we, we find out, you know, we could prove that you're lying, then the whole deal is off the table. But if we could prove that, you know, if we feel based on our own investigation that all this is true, then none of it could be used against you and you walk away from life in prison. Mm -hmm. AKA, so queen for a day meaning that that particular day you could say whatever you could admit, you could say i killed all these people i sold all these drugs i kidnapped all these people blah 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 whatever it is that you say could then not be used against you in a court of law um and as long as now if you're caught lying then like i said it could all be thrown out but all that was basically the deal he did the deal he told them everything they asked for um, and then based on what they found, they're like, okay, cool, check. You, uh, 
you did what you're supposed to do. We're dropping all these charges. You're able to walk free. Um, the weird part about this is that, um, you know, Greg, Greg was secretly recording this. You know, I don't think he was aware that there was a recording happening. And then publicly released uh, some of this audio footage. And that was sort of the basis of like the documentary that he did, as well as, you know, I had some of that audio as well when I did the Keefe interview because I interviewed Greg, Greg before. So, so when Greg uh, recorded it, did he record it on, on behalf of himself or behalf of, of the police department? The police department. I forgot what exact. I don't. I don't remember if he was FBI. No, I don't. I don't remember what particular uh, police organization he was working for. But he was doing an investigation at the time. But once he quit, he just took took all that stuff it's, with him. Got you. Yeah. Got you. I don't know what legal or ethical this is, but that's what happened. Got you. You you know something? You spoke about Queen for a day, King for a day uh, type deal. Mm -hmm. Do you think Keefe was was aware of the terms of this agreement? Because he later went on to write a book. He's done at least two interviews with you. He's been on other platforms telling his story. Do you think he mistook, mistook this proper agreement for an immunity deal? I don't know. Why? I don't know. I, be I believe the original one was actually done at his lawyer's office. So it's not like, and Keefe had a history of, of prison time, so it's not like this is someone who's oblivious to the legal system. I think that, that he is fully aware of how it works. And he, he, you know, based on what he understood, he went and did what he did afterwards, write a book, do multiple interviews, uh, and so forth. You know, now the question is whether the profit for agreement will hold to all this other stuff that he's saying. That's that's the question but that's not that that's up to a court of law you know I, I think people are also mistaking saying that um oh you know keefe has been arrested the two black has been solved it's all over like no like anyone can get arrested you can you and i can get arrested right now it doesn't mean that we're guilty of anything it doesn't mean we're getting convicted it just means that we got arrested there's a you know there's an indictment whoever signed out you know the judge signed off on it grand jury signed off on it whatever whatever and you know we got arrested, but who knows what's going to happen? We, uh, when, as you as you sat down with this guy, Keith, you sat down with him at least a couple of times. He he opened up in great detail to you, but like you said, I'm going from your book. I'm using your own word. Yeah. We're yeah. just sitting down and having a conversation. Mm -hmm. Did you find number one? It was easy to even get him in the building to talk to you, and once he got talking, you know did. Did he just willingly tell the facts? I mean, it wasn't really, you know, him and I started talking um, and, you know, we came to an agreement to do the interview. Uh, he has his co-writer was there with him. He was like, like literally like in the first interview, he was sitting, you know, to his right, my left. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there were a couple of times where he was dodging certain questions. But if you watch the interview, I would be like, well, but the book said. <laughs> X, Y, and Z. So, did it happen? Are you lying in the book? Are you lying now? I mean, you know, how do, how do you want to, you know, how do you want to resolve this? And, uh, you know, and, and coming into the interview, I had, I had the story from different angles, right? I had, mm -hmm. had Edie from the Outlaws, who was in the car right behind when the incident happened. I had Chris Carroll, who was the first responder, who showed up on a bicycle because, you know, the, the streets were jam-packed in Vegas uh, for fight night. Um, you know, and then I had Greg Kading, who has, was the investigator, who wasn't actually there. But, you know, generally all the pieces were fitting together. You know, there were a few times where, like, what he said doesn't really match up with what happened. But a lot of that is sort of unimportant details. Like the important stuff all kind of was a puzzle piece that all fit. And, and a lot of it was really, you know, for me, it was a lot of, uh, you know, I, I, I really dislike conspiracy theories. Uh, so the whole Shug had him killed, the government had him killed, the, the first responder had a dead body in his, you know, on his bike that he swapped out with Pac. Like, you know, I mean, <laughs> there's so many silly, Pac is in Cuba, Pac is still alive, like, like all this kind of stuff that, that constantly 
goes around and starts to build and, and grows legs and, and starts to walk. Uh, I want to just kind of chop a lot of that stuff down and be like, okay, this is what happened. You know, this is the chain of events that led up to it. Uh, and unfortunately, he passed away afterwards. Pac is gone. We're not going to we're not going to see Pac anymore. Um, you know, uh, and he's not living in some foreign country, you know, uh, or whatever else. He was a great artist. He had a lot of drama associated with him, and his drama led ultimately to his early demise at 25 years old. Very young guy. I'm 50. I mean, that's like half a lifetime for me. So it's uh, it's not that surprising. And, you know, whoever tries to create an alternate uh, story is, is going to be very hard-pressed to make the pieces fit together. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you, you sat with this guy um on at least a couple of occasions Twice. what what i mean you you you're a pretty good judge of people what vibes did you get from him just as an individual did he come across as a cool dude a good guy did he come across as a cold-blooded uh game thing i mean dinner <laughs> you know what i'm saying uh, we, we came in to do a job but you, you got to think that this is not a a foreign territory for me i sat down with sammy the bull larry mazza um you know i interviewed the guy who killed michael jordan's dad like like you know like me interviewing somebody who who has bodies is not very, very uncommon there's literally does you know travis rudolph like people who have killed people in all types of different situations, self-defense or, or otherwise. Charleston White, like, you know what I mean? Like, like the list goes on and on uh, of people that were involved in taking someone's life for various reasons. So when I sit down with someone, I don't know, there, 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 there's no level of kind of fear or worry or whatever else. It's like, yo, like we're, we're doing a job here. I'm gonna treat this person respectfully. I expect the same level of respect back. You know, if we're in the same room, uh, there's probably, you know, armed security in the room just in case something does go wrong. Uh, and, you know, things always go off without a hitch. We, we, we pull it off. I ask my questions. He answers them, you know, and, and you know, we, we release the footage and we go from there. So, so I got to ask, um, you, you, you spoke to him. You got to know him to an extent. I'm sure you can't tell me his birthday or his firstborn's name, but having the news, hearing this news today, you know, it, it's it's an unsolved case that, like you said, he has not been convicted of anything. Right. But somebody has been arrested for it after 27 years. Right. How, how does this make you feel just about the man? Do, do, do you empathize or, or is it like justice is done? I'll put like this when I spoke to the family Tupac's family about this what they told me without going to specifics of who and where or whatever they told me that when she was alive a Phoenix Shakur did not care in the least as to whether Pac's murder was arrested or not the, the Shakur Poor family has a very well documented relationship with the police, and it, mm -hmm. and it has never been positive. Okay, um, Afini was in a prison cell, pregnant, barely got out by the time she gave birth. Um, you know, Pac had gotten beat up by the police. Uh, Pac's last words as he was dying to the police was "Fuck you." Oh, oh, oh stop there yeah. for a second. I always thought that was rude. No, 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 Chris. Kept Carol, in my interview, actually said that. The first responder showed up, Pac fell out the car, bleeding, you know, and his thing was, like, let me get a death confession. You know, so that's a thing in, in law enforcement, a death confession. I mean, as a person's dying, they could say who killed him, and then that could be used in the law. So, so Chris Carroll was like, you know, he doesn't even know who this is. This is just a bleeding man on, on the ground, and it was like, yo, who did this to you? Who, who did this to you? And he said Pac was trying to you know, get a hold of what happened. And when he finally realized he was talking to a police officer, he said, fuck you. And then he, he fell into a coma, never to recover again. His final words on earth was fuck the police. Wow. 
right? Ah, wow. As was Orlando's words as well as he was dying. They were trying to get a confession from him about the Tupac murder, and, and Orlando told the cops, fuck you, and copped it. So hold, hold, stop there. Yeah. The, the, the alleged gunman, the alleged triggerman yeah. in Pac's case, um, Orlando Baby Lane. Yeah, and, you know, Lane Anderson. Anderson, he, 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 he literally had the same last words yeah. as Pop. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. We, we interviewed the cops around that shit. Um, so, so look, my whole thing is the Shakur family, you know, and look, uh, I can keep going on and on. Uh, you know, the Black Panthers treatment by the police. Afi, you know, Matula Shakur, Afini's husband, did 37 years, you know, over, over a bank robbery. You know, I mean, this is the, the police have always been very much a thorn in the side of, of the Shakurs, right? So I was told very plainly that Afini did not care if Pox murderers were brought to justice and arrested and put in prison. She did not care about that. She had no, you know, there would be no level of peace that, uh, you know, that another black person was being sent to prison for something. She did not care. She knew who did it, and that was all that, all that she really ever wanted to know. So when she died, she was at peace with the situation. So if the Pac family doesn't give a shit, it, it, you, you, no one else really can either, to be, to be totally honest. You know what I'm saying? If, if, if his own mother, you know, he was, you know, like his own mother doesn't care, everyone else can't, can't celebrate it. You, you know what I mean? That, that's how, that, that's how I, and, and, and as I know the family members, that's kind of how, how I view it. Like, yo, the family's not tripping. The family's not tripping. This is this is really like this right here is really for the fans, for the Pac fans. They could feel some level of closure or whatever else if if in fact he gets convicted. But I think the people that are close to the situation really don't give much of a shit. That we we've been known, like I said, I told you what was it, two thousand seven? I've known for sixteen years. None of this is a none of this is a surprise to me. You know? Okay, was it a surprise it's that not, they you know, people are, they, people who have a fun guy who's glad TV? Who is, you know what I mean? Like, they're all finding out for the first time, which is why what's happening right now in the media. Were, were you surprised, you personally, were you surprised that, um, well, two things. Number one, they raided uh, his ex-wife's house a couple of months ago in, in Vegas. Um, and then, obviously, he gets arrested. You, you're a hip-hop fan. I know you know the story. Were you surprised at all? Look, you're, you're religious and I'm not, right? You, you, yep. you believe in God and you believe in Jesus and, and you believe that, that God has a role in your life. And I, I fully respect that. I have people in my family with very similar uh, points of view and I, and I completely respect that um, completely. You, you know what I'm saying? But for me, who's not religious, I don't think that God is looking out uh, for anyone. I think, I believe in the law of averages. And if you are charged with the, you know, if you know that you're somehow involved with a murder and you continue to talk about it and do interviews and you continue to, to roll the dice over and over again, you will, at one, one point, you will crap out in that role. You see what I'm saying? At some point, the dice will not go your way. Now, you could feel that God will keep looking out for you over and over again. You could feel that you've gotten this far because of God and God has a different plan for you. And I, I respect that. For me, from my point of view, since I'm not religious, I don't look at that. I just look at like, you know, look, you play Russian roulette and you keep pressing that trigger over and over and over and over again. You'll eventually, by the law of averages, you might hit that. You will hit that trigger if you keep pressing the trigger long enough. You will have to hit that bullet. You know what I'm saying? If, it's, if, if, there's, six, if there's six bullets in there and five times you you press it and nothing comes out to me that's the law of averages that that could happen that's a, that's a perfectly reasonable explanation some people might think that god kept you from that bullet all those five times i believe there's the law of averages could have happened on that first shot also the first interview you could have done could have you know but you want to do it again and again and again and again no one could be completely surprised at the outcome i'm not surprised at the outcome okay i mean this this opens up a whole other uh, can of worms that I just want to pick your brain on. You re, you've interviewed people surrounded um, the notorious B.I.G.'s untimely demise. Do you th think that that this, in some way, 
reinvigorates the cops to say, look, there's somebody out there who knows. No. We, we, we... Go ahead. No. I'll, I'll tell you why. Because all, the only people that I've interviewed around the Biggie case were, you know, the friends and family, you know, and not even family, I mean, really the, the, the close friends of the victim, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I've interviewed, uh, I've interviewed, you know, Puffy at one point. I've, I've interviewed uh, C. Gutta. I just interviewed Charlie Baltimore. You know, you interviewed C's for Vlad TV. Um, these are all people that are connected to the victim. And no, no point did I do any interviews with someone who's accused of the actual shooting. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So no one has stepped up and said, yeah, I was in the car when the guy got shot. You know, I was, you know, the, the, the whoever was, so and so was in the front seat, I was in the back seat. He pulled out a gun and blah, blah, blah and he drove off. You know, and uh, yeah, we just, we were chased a little bit, but then boom, we got away. I've never heard that interview. I've never heard anyone say that. Whoever was involved in the Biggie murder has really kept their mouth shut. Seriously, seriously. And I've I've asked people on and off camera, and I've gotten this theory and I've gotten that theory, but no one, no one has ever told me something that was actually connected with the side of the shooters or shooter you know should i say you know i'm assuming that you know from what i heard there's only one shooter i've never heard that so what are you invigorating you're invigorating nothing like a whole you know i mean yeah like i think reggie wright said oh you know oh it's this dude that was affiliated with Shug, and he's known to be a shooter but now he's dead I, I, that's a dead end you know what i'm saying until someone says i was in the car and i and from all accounts, because you, know, you did the C's interview, I don't think there was anyone else in the car. It was like one. Correct. I have never heard someone say there was someone in the back seat or there was someone in the passenger seat. I've, I've never heard that. Now you're talking about one shooter. So unless the shooter admits to a murder and does life in prison or the person who paid him admits to it and ends up doing life in prison, I'm assuming the story is going to just die at some point and whoever's involved is going to pass away. And then, then you might get a secondhand account from someone they allegedly told, but then you're going to have to take that with a grain of salt as well. You know, you know I mean, obviously, I, I have a personal <laughs> connection. This, by the way, to, to, to the Biggie family, I know people are going to watch this and everything else like that. Like, I do hope sincerely that it does get solved, but I'm just saying, like, I haven't seen anything. I honestly, like, really, like, I honestly don't know who did it. I just have theories, but I, I would never, in the way that I've said, I know Tupac situation. I don't know the biggest situation. You know, at, getting back to Tupac and Keefe D, it's convenient that Keefe, you know, points the finger and says, yo, Baby Lane did this. Right. Um, it, I mean, some people think it was him. Right. You know, that, that, that's a story that's been, you know, floating around for years as well. Well, I, I brought this up when I interviewed him last, when I told, you know, I said that there was a, an eyewitness there who said that they saw a beefy arm stick their, you know, stick their arm out the window and, and fire. And Orlando was more of a skinny guy. You know, Keefe was big as well as a couple other people. Like Big Dre was like a big fat dude. So it, it could have been someone else. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe it wasn't Orlando, maybe it was someone else. But there's four people in that car and one of them absolutely did it. I, I, I'm sure of that. And the Orlando story makes the most sense because Orlando is the one who got jumped, you know. And, and Orlando had a, had a reputation for being a shooter as well. He was under investigation for, I think, multiple murders uh, at the time that he even got killed. You see what I'm saying? So it's not like, at, at no point, I have yet someone to come forward and say, oh, Orlando was fake. He wasn't really, like, there or whatever. Everyone's like, Orlando's with the shit. Every single person I've ever talked to, Orlando's with the shit. Like, he really was what he portrayed himself to be. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, that, that, that's, we won't really know. And, you know, it made the most sense to say Orlando because Orlando was dead at the time. Um, I don't think he'd want to put it on, on a person who's actually still alive or he wouldn't put it on himself. But, you know, 
we'll ultimately see what happens if there is a trial or if there is a guilty uh, plea, or maybe he walks away. Maybe ultimately his lawyer just says, yo, this is all bullshit. No, I don't think that's going to happen. I, you know, truthfully speaking, I, I watched the press conference a little earlier today, and they kind of gave the example, uh, look, if you go rob a bank with someone, you're in the getaway car, the person goes in, shoots the, the, the teller, teller dies, you're just as guilty as that person who went in the bank. And that's kind of kind of the theory and the logic that they're using in terms of charging him with the murder of Tupac. You were in that car, you ate it, you abetted, you wrote a book, you did interviews, and we're using your words against you. Right. I, I don't know that, that, that he walks away from this one. Possible. I don't know. Or maybe, maybe they say, listen, sign this plea deal, you'll get 20 years probation, say, say you did it, we close the case, we're done with it. No trial, no whatever, close case, everyone's happy. You're, you know, there's an old man, I mean, what is he? He's like in his 60s, he was in poor health, I think he had cancer at one point, he may have gotten over that, you know what I mean? But like, this is not, when you sit down with him, you don't know, say, wow, this is a, a young, vibrant, <laughs> you know, in shape man who's exercising and, you know, could, you know, goes jogging every morning and eats well. It's like, this is an older man. He's, you know, he's heavy set. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's not in the best health. How many years are you going to get out of this person, in, you know, if you put him in a jail cell? Probably not that many. So, so at the end of the day, I, I, don't, I don't know. Ultimately, he's only been arrested. We, we all have our guesses and we all have our theories, but he's only been arrested. And you and I remember the OJ trial. <laughs> right? Yep. If not OJ, then who did it? You know what I'm saying? None of us, you know, some people are happy OJ got away. Some people are not happy OJ got away. You know what I'm saying? Some people believe he did it. Some people don't believe he did it. But no one has ever come up with the alternate story of what actually happened. That's plausible on any level. But OJ's playing golf every day right now. Yeah, yeah. He's you know, legit, he's legitimately beat a double murder, <laughs> right? And 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 he's he living the game. He also wrote a book about it afterwards. Kind of like Keefe situation, but you know, he he was found not guilty first before writing the book. That's where things you know are a little bit different, you know, in this regard. But yeah, man, like like we we we've seen all types of shit. You don't you don't really discount things. You're also talking about a 27 year old case, where where. Essentially, everyone's dead in that car. You know, it really could have been. I was lying the whole, whole time. I wasn't even. How, how many people were in that car? Four. To your knowledge, four. Those four. Yeah. So three of them. Obviously, we know. We know. Baby Lane is dead. Yeah, so the they, other two are dead as well. Killed a few years later in the shootout. It was like some shit happened where someone, he had sold some drugs to, owed him money, they ran into each other, and then his grandmother just died, so he's already in a fucked up mood, and, you know, an argument ensued, which ended up in this massive back and forth shootout at like a, at a car wash. Um, one of the dudes got killed, I think, in a weed dispensary or something like something happened in the Swede dispensary he got killed and I think the third guy was just very uh very heavy set in bad health and just died from like just health complications Damn. if he's last or I remember of that uh of that particular group but then again like I said Keith you can turn around and say I was lying the whole time I wasn't even in that car hmm prove you know I, I, I prove, I, 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 prove that you know, do you have any surveillance footage of me there can you prove that I haven't lied on Vlad TV? And you can say, listen, I got paid by Vlad TV, so I just did it for a check. I, I needed the money, I was broke. You know, I used to sell drugs, I can't get, I, I got felonies, I can't get a regular job. My job was to lie in interviews, and that's how I paid my rent. But all of it is lies and, and prove that it's not. No one can play, place me there. Seriously, seriously. No.
You're right. You you're absolutely it right. Um, guilty. That's how it works. You know, it's interesting, Vlad. Um, I I I I went to TMZ today. They have your interview up. Um, as 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 one of the sources. Do you know if the police found anything at the at the ex wife's house? Because it just seems interesting that after twenty seven years, you know they did the raid at her house. Uh, your interview has been out for a few years now, Four at least the first one. Four, Four years. 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 Do you know if they found anything that would have them make the arrest now? And in the second part to that question. Uh, has law enforcement ever called you and instead we want you 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 sat down with him what can you tell us yeah for the last few few weeks they sent me an email uh my stance has always been that i don't cooperate uh against one of my guests in a criminal investigation you know, regardless of what people think, you know, Vlad's the police, Vlad's the feds, you know, the various lies that have been spread about me by, you know, the official stance at Vlad TV was that if you sit down and do an interview with us, we're we're not going to cooperate in, any, in anything criminal against you, especially something in regards to our interview. You see what I'm saying? So, so we've had situations where uh, the cops have tried to, you know, ask for footage or whatever else and have threatened to put me on the stand and we've always just lawyered up and been like nah we're not we're not doing it you know um i think in the case of las vegas what they wanted is they wanted a copy of uh the original footage you know probably hoping there was something maybe said in that footage that was outside of what's publicly available that might incriminate him or whatever which you know honestly like and i'm sure law enforcement is going to be watching this we, we, you know, as you know, as someone who does interviews for us, we release everything, right? Correct. It's like we release, you know, unless it coughs or says, let me go to the bathroom real quick. You know what I mean? Like, like that type of stuff, you know, like technical issues we cut out, but the actual footage, what the person says, all gets released. So they're probably thinking there's something on there, but our thing was like, we, we didn't even return their phone calls. We didn't respond to their emails uh, unless there was, our thing was like, unless there's a court order, for us to do something, we're not doing anything. We, we don't have to respond. We, we, we don't have to cooperate, you know what I'm saying? If there's a court order, then at that point you speak to my lawyer. And, um, you know, it doesn't really, uh, you know, for us it has nothing to do with whether I agree or like the person or whatever else like if you sit down with us we're not going to turn around and throw you under the bus like this is this is not what we do under any circumstance you know um, now in terms of what's publicly released we, we don't know how that works and we don't you know what I'm saying if they are able to use publicly released uh, footage for something then that's not anything that we could we could prevent uh, you know but the person's aware that that's publicly released because we've never, you know, all of our interviews are done with multiple cameras, lights, multiple recording devices, lavalier mic, shotgun mic. A person is 100% aware that they're being recorded in this recording, you know, and the recordings will be released publicly. So in that regard, uh, it is what it is. But yeah, uh, we got approached and we didn't, we didn't cooperate. And, uh, you know, now, you know, we'll, we'll see how that how it goes from there. But that, that's been our stance. And uh, we. And they also on a waiver so so they have well yeah. away yeah yeah but they're really there like everything is done completely by the book but you know we don't we don't work with the police we're not we're not here to uh we're not here to throw to to try to negatively affect someone who came in and sat down willingly on our platform you know i felt like that's, that's just that's a grimy thing to do and it's not something i would ever do well I I, t I tell you this, I didn't even expect to, to sit with you this long, so I appreciate your time, Vlad. I really do. But, you know, you, you, I, I know you can't take credit for helping to solve this case. I get it. But what I will tell you is this um, you can take, 
take credit, and I mean this as as a compliment and in the best way possible. You 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 didn't let up on this case. You kept it front and center. Uh, you know, it, it's not like me personally uh, being a bad boy at the time. You know. You, everybody knows the rivalry we were having right. at, at that time. But I, I don't wish death on anybody. Uh, my, my own brother was killed in the street. Um, and it's so difficult with an unsolved case, especially after so many years, to, to keep it ever present on the minds of law enforcement because they're dealing with new homicides every single day so i think you can take some credit um as you should and maybe the the shakur family doesn't even care um this i'll tell you this go ahead and and, uh one of tupac's siblings now and i keep in mind we're not you know i'm not talking about his the sister he grew up with because remember, he had a biological father that he met at like 25 who had a bunch of kids himself, right? But, but one of the siblings uh, reached out and said, please thank Vlad for his role in helping to, to close this case. You know, I mean, that's that, all I'm saying. That, that's on, on his father's side, which is technically his family, but it's not the family that he grew up with. You, you know what I'm saying? So th- there is a side of the family that, that is feeling a sense of closure to. Yeah, but. I, I, I think for anybody who loved Tupac, for anybody who doesn't want, listen, you're part of the hip hop community just like I. It's 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 far too often that our hip hop greats get murdered in the streets, and for some odd reason, killers just never come to justice. It's like, come on already. You got CSI, you got forensics, you got this, you got cameras on every corner. And you can't seem to solve the murder of anybody in hip hop. Um, but, 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 to be fair, but, but to be fair, you're, you're, these are you're talking about '90s murders. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a hip hop murder in the last ten years of a prominent person that's gone unsolved. You know, Pop Smoke solved. You know, Mo 3's murderer is in jail. Um, you know, uh, what, what's his name? Young Dolph. All the dudes associated with him, they're all locked up. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I, we can keep going. You know, uh, Nipsey, his murderer, locked up. You know what I'm saying? So so I, I don't think it's always fair to, to, to say, oh, these, these are hip-hop dudes or these are, you know, men of a certain ethnic background that's purposely being ignored by police. This is a very different time. There's not cameras everywhere in Las Vegas like there is now. There's not cameras all over L.A. when Biggie got killed like there is now. You see what I'm saying? This this is 30 years back. So, like I said, look what's happening now. Everyone's getting caught. Everyone's getting caught. You know, I I, I guess I didn't really think about it that way. You raise a hell of a point. Um, because even as you were speaking, I'm saying to myself, you got to understand. Yo, I mean, look, yeah, in the Wild West, people would shoot someone and move to the next town over, and that'd be the end of that one before an FBI or before interstate police. Like, yeah, like there's always going to be more ways the 80s was fucking wild you know i mean murders happening all through new york and dc and everyone walking away from it you don't see that shit now like that no not, not especially with a high profile person think about it. name one high profile rapper who got killed in the last 10 years and they don't know who did it name one no that's why i said it yeah i had to really rethink as you were speaking you're, you're probably right I, you cannot name a single one everyone got caught everyone got between cell phones, cameras everywhere, social media. You got you got the biggest police force on the planet with social media, man. Them motherfuckers will find someone right there on the picture. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, you know, I mean, shit, even even the, the, the takeoff murder right now, I mean, the guy got arrested, you know? Yeah, yeah. For the killing of takeoff. Now, he hasn't been convicted yet. You know, that might be the first one. But, but right now, there's been an arrest and there is a pending trial. So, like I said, it's just like... It's hard to get away with that shit these days, you know. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't want people to just say like, you know, yes, police do some fucked up shit. But I think in this case, I don't think they purposely ignored 
a whole bunch of clear evidence and chose not to act on it at the time. You know what I'm saying? But you know, now now there's more shit out there. You know, um, I would love to believe that, and maybe because I'm I'm close to the Biggie um, side. You know, I, I I don't I don't know that 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 case itself wasn't roadblocked by by the police in 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 the upper echelon of the LAPD. Um, I truly believe that in that particular case, it was. You know. Do you know? Do you know? Do you have an idea who did it? Do you feel like you have a solid? I, I, you know, you don't have to say who it is because we're on camera right now. But do you feel like, yo, would you go and get on? You know, would you get on the stand? And if you knew that you getting on the stand would bring justice to everyone, could you sit on that stand and say, I know that this person did it? No, I am so I could not. And I would no. send this dude to prison for killing my friend Biggie. No, I can't. Cannot. That's what I'm saying. So cannot. It's hard to accuse LAPD of wrongdoing when honestly, we all don't know, man. You know what I'm saying? And you're obviously closer to it, but I'm, I got a lot of hands and shit. Like, you know, I talk to a lot of people. Everyone just comes in with, with, with theories. So I, I don't know about that. Like, I, I'll, just, I'll just be honest. At least well, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I, the, 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 director, um, the director of, of the movie City of Lies, um, it chronicled the death of Notorious B.I.G. Um, <clears throat> Brad Furman, shout to him. Me speaking to him offline and even during our interview, uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that, that that case was railroaded internally. It was stopped. Um, so so in, can, can Sean Prez point to and, and say, I know the shooter of Notorious B.I.G.? Absolutely not. But do I feel that that case would expose uh, a hell of a lot of, of dirty cops in the LAPD? Absolutely, and I, and I think that it has been stalled. I do. But, you know, what do I know? I feel you. I feel you. And, you know, being that it happened in 97, when no one even had a cell phone, much less a camera on the phone, uh, where there's there no cameras anywhere on any of the street lights, uh, and you had a person, it wasn't four people crammed into a car, it was one person who was on a mission uh, to kill somebody. And it, it's a much more, it's a much harder situation because anyone that comes forward is basically asking to, to throw their life away. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely right. Before I let you go, um, I love what you doing on the platform, Vlad, you know, I, I, I see you dropped the LeVar Ball yeah. interview, uh, the Boosie Estates, yeah. insane. I, I see you pivoting, you know, DJ Envy and his car collection. What, what, what we got coming next on the platform? Well, the, the, the LeVar Ball house tour is about to, is going to drop. So, so there's a interview that's out right now that's you know the pieces are coming out and the you know the members have the full interview but in the same way that we did the boosie full interview and once that was publicly released then we dropped the house tour same thing's gonna happen with our ball so we got this whole kind of two and a half hour life story piece and then once that's done then you will actually see what's called ball estates which is like a uh 16 000 square foot uh mansion uh you know, that, that he really built. It's got its own elevator, its own movie theater. Uh, it's got the, the, the chandelier with the logo spinning. <laughs> and that he's been in the back, he's building a whole indoor basketball court. And uh, yeah, that type of shit. I mean, and, and I'll tell you like, when, when, I, when I think think about doing this, you and I are, are old enough to remember MTV Cribs. Absolutely. And MTV TV Cribs had a profound effect on my life because you watch this and like, I mean, I'm for, for some reason, the Tommy Lee interview always stood out to me. And I think Tommy actually lives in Calabasas. I mean, actually, yeah, now that I really think about it, that's how, like the fact that I live in Calabasas, 
I remember watching Tommy Lee's uh, Cribs and, uh, uh, you know, you've got this like grungy rock star dude who's living in this like amazing home in LA. Uh, and, and it's just like the, the beauty of it and how everything's put together in the backyard. And I remember like, why like, yo man, like I want some shit like this one day. Like I want to be able to live like this one day. And, and, and now I live almost down the street from where that episode was so much of someone setting their goals has to be able to see what it is that they're aiming at. They have to see it. You know, it's like, okay, I've made a hundred million dollars. What am I going to spend it on? Oh, I'm going to spend it on this house. I'm going to oh spend it on this car. I'm going to spend it on this jewelry or I'm going to, buy a business with it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, like this person, like, you know, you have to have role models and you have to have examples of things that you aspire to, you know? So watching Cribs as a kid, and then, you know, having a couple of rich friends in you know, like junior high and high school that had really nice homes and being invited to those homes, spending the night, getting to see, you know, having, like I never had a pool in my backyard growing up. Like I have a pool now, but having, going to my friend, you know, Mark, Mark's house, and, and playing in his pool was like so nice, you know, uh, in, in, in summer, you know, just like, yo, like, this is like, I want this one day. And, and that's the whole thing, you know, and to kind of explain, like watching Cribs, you see this and, and, and it causes people to, to be motivated and to aspire like, like myself. So I'm hoping with these, with these pieces that I do with the houses and the cars, but particularly with the houses, it'll be like, yo, this is what people are spending their money on that that, that accumulate a, a lot of money and, and the Boosie thing I think was just such the perfect starting starting block because it, it was the first time in my life that I'd ever seen someone go all in on real estate with no concept of resale you know like like the houses that I've, I've owned a few properties over the years and whenever I buy it, the first thing I think is like, okay, well, when I eventually sell it, hopefully I'm in a, I want to make sure I can get my money back out of it. You know, I don't want to do anything too crazy because it'll affect the resale value, whatever else. Boosie did not give a shit about resale <laughs> on any level. Like he has a 26,000 square foot house. And then in the back, he's got like four other houses. And then he's got a damn tree house. He's got a wishing well and two basketball fields, uh, two basketball courts, uh, a, a drive-in movie theater. Like, imagine trying to find a buyer for this in Atlanta, like, you know, <laughs> in the, outskirts, the outskirts of Atlanta, nowhere near a major city. Like, to be honest, like, you know, what I mean, it's like he's really like in the outskirts. Imagine trying to find a buyer for this and trying to get your money back out. It it would be almost impossible. But that's what what was the the beauty of it was that it's not about the resale value. It was like, yo, I'm going to build a house that I want, that I really want to live in. I want to put a bowling alley in it and a little freak room with a, you know, a fake door and, and whatever else. And, and then in the back, my kids could all live there and he named the streets after his kids and his dead homies. You know what I'm saying? And, and there was a tree house where his artists could stay at. And it was like, yo, like he built this strictly for himself and nobody else and you know and for his family for future generations and it's just so interesting to see someone go all in with their own ideas you know and their own and their own passions without having one foot in one foot out it's like no jumping in with both feet into into uh, what he believes in i think is amazing and i think so I mean, the first clip got a million views and the full interview just got a million views. So I think that people are really just like, they're flabbergasted to see this. And I think that a lot of people are going to be like, yo, I'm, I'm going to do it like Boosie one day. I'm going to, I'm going to get some land and I'm going to slowly, and he was even saying in the first clip, he was like, yo, you know, I, when I got out of prison, I didn't have a lot of money. So I just bought the land and then, okay, boom, I designed the house. Then, you know, every week, 20,000 here, 30,000 here. 40,000 here, 20,000, you know, slowly chipped away at it, paying for everything with cash because he had already lost his house when we went to prison when we had a mortgage. He, he, he figured out his mistakes. And it was like, yo, anyone could sort of take a piece of land and slowly build it up as the money comes in. And, I, and it's like, especially down south. And it was like, yo, I think a lot of people are just going to rethink shit and be like, yo, I, I, I want to do this one day. And, and now I have something to work for.
This is going to get me, I'm going to go back to college. I'm going to, I'm going to go, 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 go harder on my job. I'm going to go harder on my business. I'm going to learn how to invest. I'm going to, I'm going to cut down my, 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 uh, you know, my bills because I want something like this one day for myself and for my family. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, I watched, I watched, um, you know, the Boosie Estates clips and then the full episode and I was inspired. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, like like me myself, I'm looking at this guy walking. What is it on? 88 acres or some craziness like that? 88 acres. Yeah, that's exactly what it's like. Like really, let that sit in to anybody watching this right now. 88 acres of land. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, Vlad, I appreciate your time, brother. Just keep keep doing what you're doing for the culture. Your, your interviews. Um. You know, people can say what they want about it, but we t tune in because you give the most realist, in-depth, uh, hard-hitting questions that that we want to know. Thank you. So, 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 keep up the great work, man. I, 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 I think the you know, you know, you do black TV news as well. You know what I mean? Like you and I work together on on the, the questions and the topics, and you you execute flawlessly. You know? Yeah. So now I, I, I appreciate the opportunity. And like I said, I mean, um, I enjoy it. I enjoy the platform. So, you know, keep up the great work, man. And, uh, and I can't wait to see where the platform goes. But I think it's going in the right direction. So keep it up. Thank you, man. All the best. Peace. Likewise, brother. Be good.